Meg Griffin is a 24-year-old middle distance runner who presented to the clinic with a previous history of a right sesamoid stress fracture, which occurred 10 weeks ago. Her friend, who experienced a similar injury and was successfully managed with foot orthosis, recommended Meg to us. The stress fracture was diagnosed with the help of an x-ray and bone scan and was managed in a non-weight bearing cast for six weeks. However, due to overtraining during the season, Meg's pain has returned. The tibial and fibula sesamoid bones are embedded within the flexor hallucis brevis tendon and articulate with the plantar aspect of the first metatarsal head. Due to its larger size, the tibial sesamoid bears more weight and is therefore believed to predispose the medial sesamoid to increased pathology such as stress fractures. The sesamoids have been identified as serving multiple roles. They act to absorb and disperse weight-bearing forces from the metatarsal head and medial forefoot, which in turn provides protection to the flexor hallucis longus tendon. The sesamoids increase the moment arm of the flexors, increasing their power and supplementing the mechanical advantage of first MTPJ motion. Additionally, they enhance the gliding function of the MTPJ. Stress fractures of the sesamoid bones are classified as critical stress fractures and require special attention due to an increased preponderance of non-union. Although a true prevalence estimate for sesamoid stress fractures has been difficult to establish, Bruckner and colleagues evaluated the distribution of stress fractures within several sports over a two-year period and found that the sesamoid bones account for approximately 2% of track and field injuries and 3.1% of dance injuries. This confirms reports throughout the literature that athletes are especially prone to sesamoid stress fractures due to the increased weight-bearing forces produced on propulsion. It is particularly common in activities that require jumping, running or sprinting, as well as in dancers who spend a disproportionate amount of time on their forefoot. In general, sesamoid disorders account for 9% of foot and ankle injuries and 1.2% of running injuries. Bone is a dynamic tissue and requires constant load to initiate normal remodeling in order to aid in increasing the strength of the bone. However, abnormal bone loading can lead to pathology such as sesamoid stress fractures. The stress response that precedes a sesamoid stress fracture may occur via two primary mechanisms. The first mechanism involves the redistribution of impact forces, resulting in increased stress being applied to focal points in the bone, and the second is due to the action of muscle pull across bone. Numerous risk factors and biomechanical variables have been identified to influence the bone's adaptation process and can be divided into intrinsic and extrinsic factors. These include intrinsic factors such as abnormalities in bone strength, skeletal alignment and muscular strength. Additionally, several mechanical extrinsic factors may predispose the individual to sesamoid stress fractures. Such factors include physical training parameters such as an increase in frequency, duration of intensity, insufficient rest, excessively hard training surfaces and inadequate footwear. These training errors are a common cause of overuse injuries and are relevant as Meg has admitted to overtraining during the season. Rapid increases in training load without adequate recovery can lead to stress fractures as tissues fail to adapt adequately to the new or increased mechanical load experienced during physical activity. There are two proposed hypotheses that may explain the pathophysiology associated with the development of sesamoid stress fractures. The first is Wolf's Law, which states that the application of mechanical stress increases local bone remodeling via bone resorption. This process involves removal of bones by osteoblasts, followed by the formation of new stronger bone by osteoblasts. However, if the mechanical stress on the bone is excessive or prolonged, the resorption process is dominant. This results in excessive osteoblast activity that predisposes the individual to microfracture. The second main hypothesis is related to muscle fatigue during repetitive exercise or abnormal mechanical forces. This is believed to alter movement and strain patterns, resulting in excessive tension on specific areas of the bone that are not usually exposed to these forces. The cumulative effect of these forces results in overloading of the bone and predisposes the individual to sustaining microfractures within the bone. In summary, if micro damage accumulates, 
Repetitive loading continues and remodeling cannot maintain the integrity of the bone, sesamoid stress fractures may result. We identified two biomechanical abnormalities, the first being a plantar flexed first ray. The plantar flexed first ray position may restrict internal rotation of the tibia during early stance and results in a lack of calcaneal eversion. The lack of pronation results in a decreased ability of the foot to provide shock absorption. Also, plantar flexion of the first ray also allows for an increase in dorsiflexion of the first MTPJ. This increased dorsiflexion of the hallux may lead to increased stress on the sesamoid apparatus. The next biomechanical abnormality that we have is limited ankle joint dorsiflexion. This can potentially result in an early heel off. This may result in the metatarsal heads bearing more load for a longer period of time and contribute to further irritation of the sesamoid apparatus. The aim of our orthotic intervention was to influence kinematics and kinetics at the first MTPJ. We aim to do this by 1. Reducing hallux dorsiflexion. We hypothesise that due to Meg's first ray being plantar flexed, this may potentially increase the amount of dorsiflexion at the MTPJ and extension of the hallux. This may potentially increase the amount of pressure under the first MTPJ during propulsion and further irritate the sesamoids. Our aim to provide some degree of dorsiflexion to the first ray to reduce the amount of movement at the first MTPJ. 2. Reduce plantar pressures at the first MTPJ and sesamoids. We aim to redistribute pre plantar pressure on the sesamoids and provide shock absorption. And 3. Address limited ankle dorsiflexion. The aim was to shift load posteriorly and encourage a longer contact period of the heel on the ground. Modifications and mechanisms, and mechanisms of action. There is very limited, well-designed trials to provide evidence for modifications which offload the sesamoids. However, a number of modifications have been suggested in reviews published in various reputable peer-reviewed journals. A modification suggested by Barley and colleagues in their 2013 review was the use of a plantar cover with first metatarsal head cutout to reduce plantar pressures at the first MTPJ and sesamoids. This was hypothesized to redistribute pressure away from the first metatarsal head and sesamoids onto the lateral metatarsal heads. Additionally, the use of a softer material filling such as poron within the cutout area may provide extra cushioning and comfort under the sesamoids during propulsion. Another modification suggested in a review by Rosenblum and also in a review by Schotte and colleagues was the application of minimal cast arch fill or higher arch contour. We hypothesise that this modification may potentially assist in dorsiflexing the first ray with the aim of reducing first MTPJ dorsiflexion during propulsion, thus reducing pressure at the joint. Minimal lowering of the arch in the cast is desirable to ensure close contact of the orthosis and arch during gait. Close contact of the arch will allow pressure to transfer from the sesamoids and first metatarsal head to the shaft of the first metatarsal and more proximal osseous structures. Schulte and Schur in 2008 also suggested in the review the use of a heel lift to address limited ankle dorsiflexion and heel off. This will shift the load posteriorly and force the heel to maintain contact with the ground before propulsion and may reduce pressure on the forefoot. Johansson and colleagues showed the use of a 6mm and 9mm heel lift significantly increased ankle joint dorsiflexion and time to heel off when compared to shoes alone. In order to prescribe a custom foot orthosis for Meg, a holistic approach was undertaken and many factors were considered. We evaluated Meg's activity level, her presenting complaint, her foot type and intrinsic factors such as her BMI. Meg is a middle distance runner with a BMI of 21 which places her in the healthy BMI range and she has a foot posture index of 0 which is leading towards a cavus foot type which is commonly associated with sesamoid disorders. The completed foot tech orthotic form included our prescription of a performance plus cover type, a standard mod root, flexible 3mm polypropylene shell. It is important to note that we do not use carbon fibre as it would be too rigid and not suitable to Meg's active lifestyle and we chose polypropylene over EVA due to its potential decreased durability. The shell width and length were both standard and the arch contour preference was higher and the high point was aimed at the midfoot. We also selected a heel cup of 10mm which is standard practice according to Rosenblum. 
Based on biomechanical assessment, there is no reason for any calcaneal correction. Therefore, we selected a zero degree posting on the intrinsic posting correction section. We chose a pour on 1.5 millimetre cover that extended to the forefoot with a Cambrel bottom cover to prolong the integrity of the pour on and a neoprene top cover. It was noted that the orthotic would need to fit her footwear type, which is ASICS Nimbus. We have made a specific request that the top cover is not applied due to our preference that we will be making a planner cover with 2.5 to 3 millimeter EVA with a winged cutout. To summarize, we have requested a mod route with what we will be provided with a winged planner cutout at the first MTPJ that is made with 3 millimeter flexible polypropylene. It will have firstly Cambrel, followed by an EVA planner cover with an orthotic cover of Poron and a top cover of neoprene. The mod route device will aim to influence the kinetics at the midfoot. The wing component of the planner cover will aim to offload the sesamoids and the poron and neoprene will provide cushioning and sock absorption for the sesamoids. In order to prescribe vagal orthoses, there were many factors that attributed to the orthotic type, amount of force, shell material and top cover. Whilst there isn't clear guidelines for the construction of orthoses for a cavus foot type similar to Meg's, the style of orthotic was a custom made one specifically tailored to suit Meg and her active lifestyle, while still preventing further sesamoid stress fractures. We decided on a custom moulded foot orthoses over a prefabricated option, as custom foot orthoses have increased durability and demonstrate less alteration in shape and stiffness over time, thus maintaining prescription variables. Custom foot orthoses have been shown to improve physical function for persons with Meg's foot type and the limited range of motion available at her subtalar joint, ankle joint and mid-tarsal joint meant that a more aggressive orthotic was not required. The addition of a 6mm EVA heel lift will be made in order to compensate for the reduced ankle joint range of motion. An aggressive orthosis was, with high orthotic force was not necessary as use of rigid polypropylene for a foot type like Meg's is not recommended as high amounts of force are not well tolerated. Her limited STJ and ankle joint and midfoot range of motion, as previously mentioned, would not be able to facilitate high amounts of force during gait and as such, minimal arch fill was used to decrease the amount of ground reaction forces at the midfoot. The shell material and top cover chosen were done so as she is an active athlete and they are able to be fitted into an athletic shoe. It is suggested by Finstone that when prescribing foot orthoses as a prophylaxis for overuse injuries, such as sesamoid stress fractures, there is little justification for prescribing semi-rigid biomechanical orthoses. They are often reported to be less comfortable and there is no clear evidence depicting a reduction in stress fractures and other foot problems. Polypropylene is suited to Meg's foot type and her activity levels. Boki and friends stated that a runner with limited ankle dorsiflexion and compensation at the mid tarsal joints needs a less rigid device. As a general rule, thickness in polypropylene should be increased as the weight of a person increases. As such, Meg's BMI would eliminate the need for increased thickness. Foot orthoses are widely prescribed to treat and prevent overuse injuries and, patho and pathological conditions. However, there is little evidence about the effect of their material composition and fabrication technique or patient comfort. As such, we selected neoprene for the top cover component based on its properties that allow for a smooth surface finish and prevention of localised areas of delamination of the fibres. <laughs>